Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Autism Confidential, the podcast from the National Council on Severe Autism. I'm your host, Jill Escher, the president of NCSA. And today we're doing something a little bit different. As you know, this is mostly an interview format um, podcast. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about a news item. And then I'm going to share with you a recording that was made gosh, probably a couple months ago, but got kind of bumped because we had so many other things in the pipeline um, for this podcast. Um, but it will be followed by um, a discussion with Dr. Lee Wachtel from Kennedy Creeker Institute, and she's on our board, most of you know who she is, and her esteemed colleague, Carmen Lopez Arvizu. Dr. Arvizu is the um, medical director of the psychiatric medical health program at KKI. So um, today the theme is the word autism, right? I'm going to just talk a little bit. And then again, we're going to go to Dr. Lopez Arvizo and Dr. Wachtel talking about the word autism and um, the insanity <laughs> that has become the word autism. So today's theme, and I'm going to see if I can share my screen here, people, um, even though I know this is a podcast and most of you are listening to it, but, but um, I'm going to pull up a Twitter feed. Uh, here we go. Share screen. Pardon me as I think I am sharing now. So if, uh, if you're not on YouTube and you're listening, don't worry because I can explain things I see. So I just pulled up Twitter. And I guess this is news from two days ago. I'm a little bit slow to pick up on news. So <laughs> uh, for me, this is new news. Um, here it is, BBC News World. Singer Sia reveals she has been diagnosed with autism. CNN, singer and songwriter Sia has revealed that she has autism. Let's keep going. Let's see. Uh, Oh my gosh, and all these um, people. Here's BBC again. Oh my gosh. Anyway, you get the point. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, but the news is that uh, Sia reveals autism diagnosis two years after film backlash and uh, the, the social media pile on. Sia, page six. Sia reveals she's on autism spectrum two years after music casting controversy. All right, so what's, there's a lot going on in these little tweets. First things first, um, Sia is an internationally famous, highly successful lyricist, I think kind of composer, kind of, um, singer and performer and um, also a filmmaker now. Um, and I'm sure that most of you listening to this will be aware that two years ago, she came out with a film called Music, which was a very you know, lovely little film, not, not you know perhaps the greatest film ever made, but a lovely little film about a severely autistic teenage girl played by an actress named Maddie Ziegler. And it, prompted this immense amount of Twitterverse controversy, which was astonishing and absurd. <laughs> um, basically, uh, the, the neurodiversity Twitterverse went completely ballistic over this utterly kind of charming, small, harmless movie because, oh my God, God forbid, um, the character, the fictional character of music, um, who is this, you know, severely autistic, you know, nonverbal girl, was played by an actress who doesn't have autism. Oh my God, you know, really hold the phone, you know, call the police because can you imagine a greater sin than that? I mean, listen, movies are works of fiction played by actors who are not really the people and do not necessarily have the backgrounds and conditions of the characters they are portraying. I mean, uh, should we all cancel Daniel Day-Lewis from My Left Foot? You know, should we cancel, you know, every gay person who's 
play the straight person? Should we cancel Hamilton? You know, should we cancel like, um, I, I don't know. I, I actually, I wrote some, um, uh, some blogs about it. And here is one, the sea of shaming spectacle is a tragedy for the arts and the autism community. And it really is a tragedy for the arts to see this sort of pile on around um, something as innocuous as a film starring <gasps> guest actors. I mean, listen, I guess Sia could have hired my daughter, Sophie, who is nonverbal autistic and actually in many ways resembles the character music, but I can guarantee you it would not have gone well. And Maddie Ziegler did, I think, a lovely job with this role. So um, anyway, that was the first thing that like, oh my God, tragedy, right? Like people, like I, I'm sure that they're feeling so victimized by somebody's casting choice. It's insane. They don't really feel that way, but anyway. And then the second thing is there were scenes, at least one, maybe there were two scenes in the film where the character of music has a meltdown and she is restrained. She is held down, you know, like I think it was like by her wrists or something like that, you know, for a few moments and all was well, but they said that that is going to inspire violence, right? Against people with autism because it's uh, portraying um, very dangerous prone restraint. First of all, it did not portray very dangerous prone restraint, right? It portrayed a girl having a meltdown who was held down temporarily. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but that's an actual reality in our autism world. Parents often have to do it. Caretakers have to do it. Teachers sometimes have to do it. Nobody loves that this happens, but if somebody's a danger to themselves or others, there might be a transient restraint. And guess what? This was not, the, the film was not a how-to book. It was not like, oh, here is your, are your instructions. Here's your manual for how to perform like interventions. No, it's an act of fiction. It's a storytelling about this girl, the family's trials and tribulations, and with some musical numbers along the way. Anyway, it was, the blow up was absurd. It was based on nothing. And what I thought was most remarkable about it was the media ate it up. Like no one in the media stepped back and said, wait, 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 this is irrational, right? This is an irrational response to, you know, a debut movie by, you know, this artist who had never made a movie before and was trying to lovingly portray, you know, this autistic character. Not once. Every, it's like the media has completely gone to sleep and just sort of cuts and pastes whatever the Twitter verse, you know, the, whatever the, uh, the neurodiversity Twitter verse has to say that day. Which brings me to full circle. <laughs> back to where we started, which is Sia saying that she was diagnosed with autism. And you will see on Twitter, you know, story after story after story after story, just parroting this. You know, it, here's the theme. Sia was under attack, you know, for this controversial portrayal of a girl, which shouldn't have been controversial. Number two, now Sia herself has autism, you know, and then number three, it kind of quotes, uh, it quotes Sia saying that like, you know, for years she felt like she had to put on her human suit. Okay, listen, I don't know Sia. I've listened to some of her music. I've seen her film. I've read a little bit about her. I've seen a couple of interviews with her. She seems like a completely lovely person to me, a talented, creative person who obviously is multi-talented. And um, I would never give her a diagnosis of autism. So this is not so much a discussion about Sia. I have nothing against her, but against about the word autism. How is it that somebody who is extremely capable, extremely competent verbally, competent socially, competent in terms of her functionality. I'm sure she is quirky. We can kind of see that in her costumes and her songs. I'm sure that she is very sensitive. I'm sure that, you know, she had 
you know, social anxiety, like as a child, I'm sure all those things are true, but why in the world does that have to be labeled autism? I don't get it. I am, I have been in the autism world now for much more than two decades. And I cannot believe what has happened to this word. It is so utterly meaningless that, you know, this highly successful articulate person who's completely functional can adopt that term and not a single member of the media questions it. All they do is parrot it. And it is just amazing. You know, you have a failure of the word autism, you have a failure of the media, and you have this crazy um, kind of performance art on Twitter by the neurodiversity warriors, you know, that kind of has uh, created um, a, a force under which it is now virtually impossible to portray severe autism in the arts. Okay, are you hearing me, right? Sia has so completely capitulated to the neuromob that I can't imagine any artist in her wake daring to do anything around the subject matter of severe autism for fear of complete reputation annihilation. It boggles my mind and it shouldn't be that way. It's completely irrational. I mean, this is like this bullying industrial complex that is winning. So anyway, uh, the other thing I wanted, I want to mention about um, the bullying industrial complex on Twitter um, is how cruel, the abject cruelty of it. It's not just that they're irrational. It's one thing to be irrational. It's one thing to say, oh, you know, this film promotes violence against people with autism, which is completely unhinged, right? And it's another thing to go on and on even two years after Sia, for some reason, apologized for her film, to just pummel her with artifice, but art like artificial complaints. Like here's one, Sia, don't expect the entire autism community to welcome you with open arms after what you've done to them with your God awful ableist movie by making them look horrible. How do they look horrible? They had a character who looked just like my daughter. Are you saying my daughter makes autism look horrible? Hmm. Sorry, why don't you go after my daughter and not see ya if that you know makes the autism community look horrible. Um, here, um, can we not invalidate Sia's autism just because we don't like her? Here, Sia is autistic. No way Gurley produced the most insensitive autism de depiction in a movie just to be autistic herself. I'm not even sure what that means, but that's crazy. Sia getting an autism diagnosis doesn't change the fact that she's incredibly ableist and did so much damage to autistic people. No, she didn't. Especially high supports needs autistic people. No, she didn't. It was a miraculous, wonderful thing that somebody like my daughter was depicted on the big screen. There was no damage done. It doesn't erase anything she did and we don't have to forgive her. Fuck her. I mean, the cruelty. I remember Sia saying after the whole pile on episode that she became suicidal. And you know, if you're not prepared for this level of utter BS, yeah, and you're a sensitive person like Sia, yeah, you can become suicidal. But now Sia has autism. Hey, listen, Sia has something, I'm sure. Why do we have to call it autism? So with that, I am going to stop blabbing and I am going to um, have our wonderful producer, Lee Syatt. Everyone, shout out to Lee. Thank you, Lee. Um, uh, I'm gonna have him plug in this older discussion about the word autism and the trivialization of it, the meaninglessness of it um, with Dr. Lopez Arvizo and Dr. Wachtel. Thank you, everyone. I'm going on vacation next week with my beautiful daughter. Um, and I will not have a podcast out, um, but we will be back uh, later in June. Okay, thank you everyone. And now turning it over. Today, 
instead of doing sort of a straightforward interview, which is the usual format, we are we get to talk. <laughs> we get to do more of a roundtable discussion. And our topic today is something that obviously came up in Dr. Wachtel's presentation, and that has come up increasingly over the years. And that is the word, da da da, autism. <laughs> and what does it even mean anymore? And how did we get into this mess? And what a mess we're in? And um, some examples of this mess, and um, you know what might come next. So I I'm just going to start off with a little bit of historical perspective. So. I follow autism research very, very closely. I've been reading autism research like the hyper geek that I am um, since the 2000s, earliest 2000s. Um, but if you go back into the literature, this is not hard to find. 1988, for example, Fred Volkmar, um, who is a preeminent autism researcher out of Yale um, in the New England Journal of Medicine writes a paper about autism and he calls it a quote, devastating disorder. Then let's go ahead about 10 more years and um, in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, which is probably the most prominent autism research journal. And the researchers there called autism a complex, devastating disorder. Now let's go back, go ahead like another 10 years and we see it like Joseph Buxbaum, who's out of um, uh, Sinai, um, calling autism a devastating neurodevelopmental disorder. But then you go like to today and all of a sudden there's this quote unquote new understanding of autism as something that's a difference, a condition, and maybe it's a devastating disorder in some cases, but in most cases, it's more like a, a difference. It's more like something that's not necessarily serious or incapacitating. I mean, I can, I can go on with dozens and dozens of, exam, of, of examples to prove that autism was considered a very serious and often devastating developmental disorder. So let's fast forward. Here we are today, and we're in this mess where this one word is supposed to do so much heavy lifting that it means you know kids like mine who are nonverbal and have capacities of maybe toddlers or preschoolers um, to somebody who is uh, a PhD to somebody who is a doctor, to somebody who is a lawyer, right? To somebody for whom autism is a challenge, right? But not really a developmental disorder or neurodevelopmental disorder. All right, guys, that's my groundwork for where we're, we're for where we are headed. <laughs> um, Dr. Wachtel, what has your experience been? Uh, you've been a, in the autism field for a long time. How have you seen the word evolve? So I guess I'd have to agree with you in terms of the gradual evolution from a term that refers more to disability, disorder, problem, in need of research, treatment, cures, and interventions to something that has really taken on a very different character and almost swung in completely the opposite direction in some circles. So I think the caveat to that would be in my line of work on the neurobehavioral unit over the 20 years that I've been in the field, um, autism still represents individuals who are very impaired, the vast majority of whom have concomitant intellectual disability, minimal to low, no language, very significant comorbidities, whether those are psychiatric, medical, genetic, or combined, and who are going to require significant supports for the rest of their life, will never live independently, or earn a living wage, run for office, drive a car, do any of those things, and certainly not attend university. But I think outside of my inpatient unit, um, what I've started to see I mean, in society at large is not only an explosion in the number of people who are not only diagnosed with autism by professionals, but also self-diagnosed and have adopted autism almost as, as a form of an identity and a way to 
explain themselves to themselves or a way to kind of explain the unique way in which they interact with the world. But those individuals um, really have very little to nothing in common with the types of individuals that I work with. And I think you alluded to some of the early research on autism that the types of patients that I work with are very much along the lines of those for whom autism is a significant impairment um, and, uh, and certainly like a disability. But we found ourselves in a really unique time in, um, in 2023, and I think this is like kind of burgeoned maybe over the last decade in terms of issues related to disability and identity, and then the DSM um, widening kind of the scope of autism to this spectrum where like one word can refer to things along a huge spectrum. You could be way out on the right side of the spectrum and way out on the left side of the spectrum and really have like nothing in common, but still get that same uh, diagnosis. And I think that's led us to like a lot of like reconsideration in terms of conceptualization of our patients and conceptualization of diagnosis, whether our paradigms are really accurate and other ways to conceptualize patients so that everybody, um, so that it's more than a term and that it's not necessarily a single term, but maybe more of a constellation of terms or terms or a, more, a wider descriptor or descriptors that would allow us to capture those different individuals that are that we try and push into one rubric, but don't really fit anymore into one rubric. Excellent. Yep, I agree. Dr. Lopez Arvizu. So, you know, uh, I think very, very similarly. So, in Dr. Voltaire takes care of the inpatient world, my world is all outpatient. And I serve patients that are in pretty much in every, you know, stop of that spectrum. And there's no way that I can compare one extreme to the other. The needs are so different. And the presentation of their, difficulties are so wide and and profoundly different. So I I understand the DSM for you know but this in five effort to take away the Asperger's word because it was just also a word that you know did not want to be used, but the pushing everybody together in this spectrum mashup, it's not beneficial for the ones that have the most significant needs. It's just like when you have diabetes, you can have diabetes that it's well-maintained and easy to manage, or you can find a very fragile one that require a lot of resources and care. And there's no antagonism between one category and the other in the way that we see now in the autism conversation. We, I think we are seeing more and more of the ability of, of some individuals to speak very strongly about their feelings about the diagnosis and the past definitions and past implications and kind of almost canceling anyone that has a different opinion now that we are in the new you know, modality of canceling people that we disagree mm -hmm. with. So it is, it is, it has limited the, the ability to have an open conversation and kind of be collaborat collaboratively working together instead of being so antagonistic. That's, that's what it has become, a very antagonistic conversation instead of a collaborative effort. Yeah, yeah I wanna emphasize one thing that um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Lopez mentioned regarding cancellation. I think that unfortunately, what we've seen um, amongst individuals who would be more on the um, the end of the high functioning autism, don't have language impairment or intellectual disability, is a sad like um, almost immediate knee jerk re uh, reaction to cancel those on the more severe end of the autism spectrum. And you do not see the reverse. You typically don't see um, well caregivers of those with severe or profound autism who are not capable of engaging these types of discussions wishing to um, cancel those on the higher functioning end of the spectrum. But that's made for a really challenging landscape in terms of moving forward and meeting the needs of a wide range of individuals with autism. Yeah, I think these, these cancellation efforts are not subtle. I mean, you see uh, right now people with high functioning autism or who self-identify as autistic 
um, attempting to really control the language around autism, right? Reading the, the, the vocabulary, not of words that pertain to their autism, but reading the vocabulary that really pertains more to those who are low functioning and who are suffering and who are severely disabled. So you see a kind of real life, like uh, almost um, explicit kind of erasure, right? Of, of the terms that would characterize the realities faced by those who are more severely impacted. And then you see marginalization, for example, um, you know, on the IAC, uh, which is the, the Federal Advisory Committee on Autism, um, it's heavily stacked by people who quote unquote have autism or represent autism, but really just those who but are high functioning. Yeah. So, I mean, so, you know, it, what, what you have in the end is this um, kind of exclusion and marginalization of, you know, it's hard to say it's about a third at least of the population that has more severe forms of autism. And then if you count the people who have borderline intellectual disability, you know, um, who are, are clearly are in, in a segment that is struggling with autism, even though they may have language and, you know, some cognitive capacity, you know, ab above what the severe group has, you know, they, um, they're more than 50, per together, that's more than 50% of the population. You know, but nevertheless, you know, it's seen as, you know, something that should be avoided. But, you know, um, so I, I think we're going to talk about like just an example of how extreme and weird this whole kind of, uh, you know, vocabulary fail has been. And I consider autism to be a complete cap vocabulary fail. Um, so there's uh, most of you people out there in the listener land have heard of Spectrum News. Spectrum News is published by the Simons Foundation, which is a, a private foundation uh, that is funded exclusively, uh, as far as I know, um, through the wealth of one man, which is um, Jim Simons. He's one of the wealthiest people in the United States. He seemed, I have never met him. He seems to be a very good guy and very, very smart. I have nothing against him. Um, but he he has uh, definitely been a, a huge supporter of autism research and genetics and neuroscience. More power to him. Um, but but he also funds this thing called Spectrum News. Um, the foundation funds it, uh, which is editorially independent of his foundation, but dependent on on the foundation's money. And um, they regularly, really on a, a, a daily basis, on the weekdays at least, churn out um, news stories and features. And they have a very, very strong neurodiversity bias in their reporting. I don't think anybody would disagree with me. Basically all the researchers I talk to roll their eyes half the time at the features that appear in Spectrum News. Most people don't even read it anymore. But, um, but you know, you, you, you see sometimes they, they take a very uncritical approach to neurodiversity. And, um, you know, just recently, um, I'm going to do a little bit of reading here. They had this, they ran this article, doctors with autism speak out against stigma. All right. So uh, never mind the fact that neither of my children even understand what a doctor is. <laughs> uh, but, you know, they use doctors with autism. And here we are told, um, when Talil Javed received a formal diagnosis for autism and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder at 27 years old, she felt shock, confusion, and relief. Certain reactions began to make sense, like all the time she had felt overwhelmed by noise on the bus and missed her stop, or when she had a full-blown panic attack after a challenging conversation at work. For as long as I can remember, I have not felt I belonged anywhere up until the diagnosis, she wrote in an email. Javed is a psychiatric doctor in the UK and has what is called high-functioning autism, she says, meaning that she is able to live independently, but can have trouble with sensory overload, communication, and expressing emotions. The condition is typically diagnosed later in life. Surveys estimate that about 1% of doctors, primarily G GPs and psychiatrists, are autistic. Many hide their diagnosis from their colleagues because they worry they will be stigmatized. Um, never mind that the fact the survey they're referring to was like conducted by like, you know, a 
ideological you know, group. <laughs> and I think it's very, very questionable uh, methods, but nevertheless. So this is what Spectrum News considers to be autism. This is, and we just heard it, sensory overload, communication, uh, and uh, difficulty expressing emotions. Okay, that describes a lot of people I know who, who mm -hmm. don't have autism. So this is what I want to pose to yeah. you guys. And that's not what Canner initially described. So autism is oh, taken most like definitely not. So I'm not saying, character. yeah, like Dr. Javed probably has something going on and probably has challenges. I do not deny her her problems, right? Why autism? Why is this the label? Why, why can't we come up with something else to apply to people like this? Tell me. It's become almost a sadly almost like faddish to um, for individuals who have the types of challenges that are described in that article to uh, adopt the term of you know to identify as um, being autistic and i think that in sharp contrast to many patients with autism particularly the ones that dr lopez and i work with autism had taken on kind of this character of like almost like a fantasy a, like you know a gift like it's actually it's special to be this way and you know you you bring something like special and unique to the world that other people don't have and it's become kind of cool and interesting to be neurodivergent and it seems that a lot of people rather than perhaps looking more deeply at um the crux of the issues that are that they're experiencing have happily taken on this moniker of, of, of autism as something that you know explains explains the challenges that they feel that they have and that they can also like pawn off as like a very positive thing because now the current trend is you know, all autism should be embraced and experienced and celebrated as a gift and so you can turn what your struggles were into something that you can claim that people should celebrate um, and I think it gives people kind of like a lot of uh, an, an out in like a way to take on this term and and erase any type of negative negativity or association of a challenge with what they're experiencing. But unfortunately, it just really bears no semblance to what autism was when it was initially described you know, by Kanner, when it was studied in like the 70s by Rudder. And I mean, all the like research that we have on autism is not what currently people are terming autism. And that does do a disservice to those who have, I guess, more classic or more true forms of autism. I have to agree. So, you know, that's that's exactly the, the issue, the classic definition of autism. I don't I don't see a problem with with some people identifying their differences or or labeling them themselves neurodivergent. It's fine. We all have our little quirks and our little differences. And and that's fine. However, the use of, of the word autism, it's taken to the extremes into because it, we need it for policymaking, for accessing services, for accessing education, and changing, you know, presenting this as a as some, you know, neurodivergence. That is such, such a simplistic way of represent what we see. There's so many of the, the, the people we serve that I will never be able to even understand what a word doctor is. So that is that is what the conversation should be about. You know, if we are going to define this or if it's defined as a spectrum, then allow the middle of the spectrum to move and allow the the both extremes and, and the ones that are in the middle to be able to have a voice as well. Do not dominate the conversation because that is what bias is. And you know that that's something that we don't talk about enough in this kind of of articles like the Spectrum publishes. It is the bias. You know, you are absolutely writing all these documents with the bias that autism is something that is just a difference, and that is not what we see in the population we serve. And you know, very often, I I tell the parents of many of my patients, you know, I do not know how it is to live the life you live, because I don't know. I have a semblance of an idea, but I'm not the one taking care of your child 24 seven. I'm not the one that is terrified that maybe, you know, somebody's going to get out of the house and walk across the freeway or mm -hmm. worse, you know, be arrested or shot because somebody thinks they're on drugs and trying to rob me. So I, there's no way, even though I take care of these, of these families and these patients, there is no way I can speak for them because I do not live the way they do. So this bias and this extremism on both sides of the spectrum 
has to stop to really be of service for the population that we serve. So I'm curious, you guys, you've had long careers in medicine. How many doctors have you met who you would diagnose with autism? None. None. <laughs> uh, the one in, what was that, Grey's Anatomy? There was one. <laughs> oh, the one on TV. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The TV doctor, right? Who doesn't exist in real life. And, and you know, one, one of the things is that maybe there, there are there, but that has nothing to, you know, that, that's not a label that I would care about. Right. So I what care label? about, you I know, mean, a physician that can take care of my medical needs. I don't care about anything else. Whatever label they might have. If they have <laughs> autism, okay. If they have social anxiety, I don't care. What I care is that they are able to deliver adequate medical care. That's all. And they're also able to achieve so many more things. I mean, just thinking about somebody who's been through medical school, that means that they succeeded at a very high level throughout their secondary education. They succeeded at a high level in, in college. And then they went on to medical school. They completed a residency. They succeeded. They functioned and succeeded at an extremely high level. And I don't really have a problem so far. I mean, anybody can call himself whatever he wants. I mean, at the end of the day, that's like, you know, their business. But the issue really becomes then when people have adopted this term. And for some reason, people who, who have adopted the term, uh, the identity as autism, take great offense at the idea that some people who are classified also as having autism cannot do the things that they can do. As if like saying that, they're, well, I have autism and I'm a physician, they can't recognize, they don't want to recognize, it offends them, it upsets them to imagine that some people who have a diagnosis of autism need somebody to take care of them 24 hours a day. They can't dress themselves, they can't toilet themselves, they cannot make any type of decisions. Maybe they can choose between having a vanilla and a strawberry ice cream. They can't live independently. They're never going to be able to do any of those things that these other individuals like physicians who claim they have autism can do. And that's really like, for me, where the problem comes. Like if a physician wants to say they have autism, like, okay, that's fine. Good, go, go for it. But if saying that you have autism as a physician means that you're going to negate the fact that many people with autism, their only interaction with physicians are going to be as mass consumers or hopeful consumers, if they're able to get services, consumers of medical services, you know, it has to, you can't like, you can't say that those people are discounted or that their diagnosis isn't real or come up with all sorts of other like nonsense statements. Like, well, actually those people are just as high functioning as I am. It's just, it's a societal issue or you don't know how to understand them. And if you listen to me, I mean, those individuals, I really, you know, when I hear that type of garbage, I feel like, you know, inviting them. Okay, well, you know what? We're always short of direct care staff on a neural behavioral unit. So if you'd like to come and work with some of my patients and um, talk to them about like running for office or what type of job that they'd <laughs> like to have and how they're going to purchase an apartment, have at it. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally see your point. I mean, um, I, I won't mention names, but there are those quote unquote autistic doctors. Of course, I don't see a speck of autism in these people, but whatever, um, you know, who, who, who have been antagonistic towards those who speak out on behalf of the severely affected, um, you know, kind of saying that we're not treating them with dignity. We're not treating them with respect. We're disparaging them when all we're doing is communicating their reality. Like it's inherently awful. Like their, their existence is inherently awful to these people. Anyway, I won't, I won't elaborate on that, that too much, but you know, like what about another diagnosis for, you know, these people who are so super functional, so super successful, you know, they don't really have, you know, severe social communication problems because here they are, they're able to, you know, to, to uh, express very complicated thoughts and, you know, converse daily about complicated cases, right? They have an immense capacity for abstract thinking, right? And what, what about another diagnosis? I mean, is there anything in the DSM? I mean, you, you guys are members of the APA, right? The American Psychiatric Association. I mean, like, is there anything in the book that could be applied instead of autism, some kind of personality disorder, maybe a mix of sensory disorder and anxiety disorder, or like what? Well, I, I think, you know, you, you just brought up one point. I think that one of the, and it, as it's my understanding, and again, I do not 
mean to speak for them, that for the individuals that, that are in the one spectrum of the high functioning autism is that it is not a disorder, right? There is this explanation that I have heard that they will you know, perceive this as a social kind of construct and not a disorder. Right. So, so maybe they don't belong in the autism category at all. Maybe they, they are not a disorder, right? So maybe they belong somewhere else. Right. That it's not in the spectrum that that actually is a disorder and that actually requires all these intense um, interventions through their lifespan. So, yeah, absolutely. Now, the other part, though, that it's interesting is that when you mention about about the physicians issue is that, you know, we know that in healthcare education, there is very little education about neurodevelopmental disorders across the board. So on, unless you are in a very specific track like pediatrics or neurology or palliative medicine, you really do not get any education on neurodevelopmental disorders. So that's one of the, the complications of any physician or any healthcare provider, really, you know, any kind of, of other like nursing or, you know, physical therapy, whatever, they're not exposed to the, to the, to the edu being educated about the population we are talking about, about this mm. lower side of the spectrum. So what do they hear? They hear about the ones that can actually speak, that they actually find a voice. They don't hear from the ones that do not, because they often do not see them in, even in the office, because mm -hmm. families cannot drag them there, right? So right. that is the other part, you know, people are not exposed enough to the, the kind of uh, patients we serve because they are in the more complex category and that precisely because of, her, of their difficulties are not able to be fully included in the community life. Yeah. So that is a reality. That's why they don't see them because they're not out there. Yeah, like we see most of most of the individuals that Dr. Lopez and I service, like or work with, are not able to they're not able to be in like any type of like community line life except maybe like in the emergency room. And I think it's particularly you know a lot of these issues with like identity and cancellation and this new stuff that we've had to deal with in the United States are particularly driven by like the younger generation. Um, who I think like really has very little to no knowledge. I mean, outside of health healthcare professionals of what autism really can look like, unless they've had like a family member who has the type of autism that Kenner like initially described. Um, you know, I've seen that in my own kids who are very familiar with my work and in their college experiences, listening to stuff about oh, neurodiversity and I have autism and all diversity is a gift and there's no such thing as disability and. Um, you know, as much as I've gotten like a bad, bad response, sometimes speaking out to the contrary, I've seen that in my kids as well, pointed out that like, um, I think that um, my middle son said it best, I don't see any gift in needing to wear like a hockey helmet all day so they don't smash your head in. But that's not the reality that most people see. Right. I mean, no one sees like my son. Most people will see my daughter who's very easygoing and you know, but I can't take my son anywhere, basically, at all. I mean, he's, he's as isolated as can be, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, that's just reality. You know, people just don't, a lot of people don't even know I have a son, right? They, they just never, never see him. And he's not going to be on a TV. He's not going to be on a panel. He's not going to speak out at the ICC. He's not going to, you know, um, uh, you know, lead a rally he's not going to be on twitter right. tweeting about his reality nothing 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 so he's about as invisible um as, as you can get i think um so and they don't really want to see people like your son when those people are mentioned in the context of like professional meetings you get a lot of hedging like oh well well let's talk about something else mm -hmm. yeah so what should we do i mean I, what 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 are what's the path for obviously um the biggest step forward um, is uh, the uh, creation of the term profound autism by the Lancet Commission um, in 2021, which refers to um, the more affected subgroup of people with autism, you know, people who have intellectual disability, people who um, need, uh, you know, 24-7 care or almost 24-7 care if they, you know, have some access to supervision and help. Um, so that's a definitely a, a positive step. But what, what, in your, in your view, what would be, what, what would be the ideal step forward here? Thinking. <laughs> I had a simple answer for that, but you know okay. the reality is that 
we need to start talking about bias and and to make sure that that we share that with everyone that you know there 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 needs to be to be more inclusive opinions that there needs to be inclusion of of, of opinions that might not be necessarily um supportive of of your theory but that we need to have a conversation and and a civilized conversation not when one of the parties is afraid to speak because being afraid of being your career destroyed because that is the reality of things people are afraid to talk but you ultimately unfortunately yeah. amongst amongst a lot of professionals i think that Carmen and I are probably a lot more willing than others to like, you know, speak out and speak the truth. Um, but many people are not because they, yeah, they don't want to be canceled. And they don't want to, you know, they don't want to get in trouble. And that just perpetuates, you know, this situation ongoing. And you just can't really imagine like any situation in elsewhere in medicine where, for example, like if you are an oncologist and wanted to work with, you know, stage four, like metastatic cancer, you would be like ostracized because you talked about it rather than preferring to work just with like stage one, you know, circumscribed cancerous um, presentations. Like you would probably be the opposite. You'd be like lauded for wanting to do this and for wanting to, you know, work with and recognize and advance the research on and treatment options for people who are most like severely afflicted. What we find ourselves in aut with autism to be in a very like opposite and a perplexing state of affairs where like you know there's there's such a fear to speak about it and you know I'm not sure I think is somewhat maybe the solution lies along the lines of um, separate diagnostic um, categories so that different diagnoses can be given to people who present very differently as they should be just like you know you don't just say like you know oh well you have like hypertension well it matters if you have like mild moderate or severe hypertension I mean, you know, you, you have myopia. Well, okay, there's not like one size fits all like lens. It matters like what your value is. And um, that's critical in everything in medicine. And I think there does need to be, people do need to have a little bit more guts in terms of speaking up and, and standing like for the truth. <sighs> But it's hard. It is. It is definitely hard because nobody is really protected, and we do live in a society where ultimately, like, identity cannot be touched, and people are able to claim whatever identity they want. And the minute, the minute you start to suggest that they claim identity and instant authority, right? I mean, it's right, exactly. Is like you're the only one who can like speak about it, which like absolutely like makes no sense it's like one of the most ridiculous statements i've ever heard like you again i always use the example so you can only be an oncologist if you like were a pediatric like cancer survivor i mean that's just like bs that makes no sense at all and they're not an instant authority and they don't know i hear those statements all the time well if you listen to us you would know well no we won't because you don't know either so and if you think you do come to my unit and show me because you can't no and you i think know. As, just like we cannot generalize about the the more complex side of the spectrum, we cannot generalize about the high functioning side of the spectrum either. So both of those are so drastically different. There's no way that they can even meet in the middle of or, or, or needs or definition. So I, I agree with Dr. Wachtel that there needs to be two separate diagnoses, you know, two separate categories. And then you brought up about the DSM. So which one should stay in the DSM? Should, should profound autism or, or the population that we defined as profound autism in our practice should even be in the DSM? Maybe maybe the, the high functioning can stay there and the other one can be a disorder and, and be as a medical condition. I don't know. You know, well, when, the high functioning high people with high functioning autism, like those individuals in many of those, those articles, don't want autism to be in the DSM. That's like one of the goals of some of these advocates is that she be removed from the DSM in the same way that homosexuality was removed from the DSM like a half century ago. So if they don't want it to be seen as a disorder, well, great, pick another term for it and like you know go on your merry way. Um, right, they don't want it in the DSM, but they they just. Yeah, I think like at some point, some form of like a reason has to prevail. I think that we're stuck in the United States with like skewing, skewing reality for a lot of fantasy on many levels. And at some point that like needs to stop, um, particularly when it comes to, you know, it's just the whole thing of like fighting for equality and equity and like equal rights for everybody. It's like I always say you cannot fight for like um, you know, racial equity and like spout anti-Semitism at the same time. That's incongruous. And if you act like that, you're just a hypocrite. 
And I think it's the same thing when you're looking for advocating for rights for people with disability. If you want to advocate for yourself as somebody with high functioning autism, at the end of the day, you're just a hypocrite and just as bad as anybody else who has dis who has um, discriminated against people with disability. If you're writing out of the equation, those who are the most severely afflicted. And, and I think, you know, canceling the people that that speak for for that lower end of the spectrum, you are canceling these individuals that cannot really speak for themselves, but not giving a, or allowing the opinion of the ones that care for them. You are doing exactly what you think they're doing to you. <laughs> so, you know, that that yeah. is the problem. That is the bias. That is the narrow view of this concept. You, you know, I cannot, I'm not speaking for, for the medical profession. I'm speaking from my experience as a child psychiatrist, and from my experience and treating individuals in the autism spectrum from the higher to the lower. And I don't like the higher and lower thing, but it is what it is. So I, I don't, I don't, I have experienced the whole spectrum and they're very different. There, there's no way that you can compare and you cannot generalize. You cannot generalize labels. You cannot love it, um, generalize clinical presentation right. and you cannot generalize their needs. There's no way. Right. And that's, uh, you know, the, the reason we have diagnoses in the first place <laughs> is to have meaning in terms of presentation, in terms of uh, treatment, in terms of prognosis and trajectory. Right. I mean, it, and it's all broke. I think it's broken with autism because it doesn't help um, there. Now, there are these levels that we're going to close on this particular question. The DSM-5 um, does have these levels, one, two and three. Um, do you think that that's at least a step in the right direction? Um, should there be more? Should uh, is is level one just so overbroad that it's now inclusive of these people who really just have anxiety and sensory issues? Um, what what do you think? One problem right off the bat with the DSM-5 is that although it gives you the option for specifiers, it does have specifiers and it also has comorbidities. It doesn't require that you list those comorbidities. And I think a lot of practitioners are going to hedge right off the bat from saying, nobody wants to hear necessarily your child has autism with intellectual disability and language delay. Right. It's not like it's not a rosy picture. And many people hedge on that and they don't list those comorbidities. And so the DSM, I think, does allow potentially for accurate classification if practitioners were listing, okay, this person has autism, it's level three, they have intellectual disability, they have a language delay, they have these psychiatric and medical comorbidities. Um, but that's not that's not regularly done because a lot of people don't want to don't want to hear about it. Um, well yeah I, I definitely think that especially when they're diagnosing young children. Um, and those are the ones, you know, the ones who are more severe, the ones who get diagnosed younger. We've seen that in the research. Um, the clinicians, including with respect to my, both of my kids, are very hesitant to say too much um, about it. And so you'll get a sort of broad, like my, both of my kids were diagnosed with autistic disorder, which was the term at the time. Um, but, you know, they didn't want to say too much uh, because they don't want to devastate the parents, mostly, right? Um, and also, I think there's a, a certain amount of uncertainty, not a huge amount, but a certain amount of uncertainty about trajectory. So the label of autism can, you know, it's a, a double edged sword. You know, if you're in school, it can get you access to more special education, more additional services and whatever. But if you're in the severe end, the autism word can close a lot of doors for you for accessing any kind of community services or activities. So I, I think some people will avoid it for that. Interesting. Well, listen, I think we are at the end of our time here. I know we all have other meetings and you have patients, um, but this was a really interesting conversation. It brought up a lot of things that um, we're facing in the community and that you face as medical professionals. And um, clearly this issue of like, what is autism and can we fix this broken piece of vocabulary is, is yet to be resolved. <laughs> Um, it will it will take more time and more, and more work, but um, I think as we develop increasing clarity, increasing boundaries, uh, 
you know, it will be better for the patient populations and it'll be better for practice and research. So let's keep our fingers crossed for that. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Confidential. If you'd like to learn more, share an idea for an episode, or become a sponsor, please visit us at autismconfidential.org. The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individual speakers. Content presented is for informational purposes only, and we do not provide any medical or legal advice.